So, we're going to look at diagnosis, epidemiology, control of infection, a little bit about vaccination, and finish up with a bit of discussion of healthcare associated infection. When we look at the diagnosis of infection, we shouldn't always think about the laboratory as our first port of call. We can actually make a clinical diagnosis. So, a medical practitioner may listen to someone's chest or listen to their heart through a stethoscope. They may engage in a number of non-microbiological investigations. So they may take x-rays. They may get a CAT scan or MRI scan. They may get some hematology results or biochemistry results to see what's happening in the blood, uh, what's happening in terms of the chemical composition of body fluids, that kind of stuff. And that can all give clues as to whether someone is infected or not and sometimes even tell you what they might be infected with. But what we're going to focus on for the next few slides is the laboratory diagnosis of infection, particularly microbiological diagnosis of infection in the laboratory. So if a medic sus suspects that there's infection, then he or she will... Hello? There's no handout for this lecture. I said that at the beginning. That will be coming for the next lecture. I shall bring two along for that. So you've got three handouts for the previous three lectures. I'm sorry, but the office is very busy, and these are very large classes, so get all those handouts printed, take some time. So where was I? Yes, yeah, so if a medic suspects infection, they'll take uh, swabs and samples of tissues. Uh, these are CSF samples, for example, cerebral spinal fluid, nice and clear and, uh, and sterile. But they may end up taking samples like feces or pus, uh, which are rather more offensive, but also very informative as well. Now, one of the problems, I mean, you should never get ill in August, because that's the time when the, when the new house officers start in the hospital. And although they've done all those years training as medical students, they actually turn out to be fairly clueless when they get on the ward, and they do all sorts of wrong things. So some, these are some of the things that limit the usefulness of microbiological investigations in the lab. So if you don't obtain and handle the specimens properly, then they may be rendered worthless. So if someone takes a CSF and then decides they're going to sit down and watch a movie and uh, then play a game of pool and then eventually take it maybe five hours later to the lab, the CSF will be worthless because the bacteria in it will have died. Um, specimens should be obtained from the site of infection and handled aseptically, taken aseptically. So we mentioned before about the problems of sticking a needle in to take blood cultures. Again, those first, uh, the first few days and weeks when house, house officers come, we get a lot more contamination in blood cultures because they're just a bit ham-fisted and haven't got used to taking samples, yet we get coagulase negative staphylococci growing through. Sample size must be large enough, so... We may, uh, in some cases, if we take in the urine, then just a few mils of a midstream specimen of urine for conventional microbiology will be fine. But when we're dealing with tuberculosis, if we think someone might have tuberculosis, there are very few cells in the volume, uh, in any volume of fluid or, or, or tissue. And in those cases, we actually take what we call an early morning urine, where we take the whole of the volume of urine that's voided first thing in the morning, maybe 400, 500 milliliters of urine be required. And as uh, kind of hinted earlier, if you don't respect the organisms in terms of their metabolic requirements, their requirements for, say, anaerobic culture, uh, for being held at uh, body temperature, all that kind of stuff, then they will just die during transport and we won't recover them. Another little introductory thing before we get into the heartland of really what's going on in the laboratory. Uh, in, one of the problems of handling samples in the, in, in the laboratory is that they actually present a risk to the handler, to the microbiology staff. And so we actually have to be very careful about handling things, getting them labelled properly, bagging them up properly. And within the lab, we, we designate labs as BSL 1 through to 4, depending on how hazardous are the materials that are being handled. So in a BSL 1 lab, you're not handling anything that's ever pathogenic. BSL 2, you're handling potentially pathogenic organisms, potentially if, you, if, a, if they got into a wound or whatever, they might cause infection or if someone swallowed them. But generally, if they're handled properly, they won't be a problem. BSL-3 we use for tuberculosis primarily and a few others. 
And there's this lady showing you here, BSL-4. There are very few of these labs in the country. There are uh, some at, Col at um, Porton Down. There they handle nasty things like Ebola virus and Lassa fever. <clears throat> so that lazy house officer, or should we say busy house officer, in their first few weeks in August, often scribbles on the form when they want microbiology done. They write M, C, and S. And what they're asking for here is microscopy, culture, and sensitivities, the three kind of basic modalities in which we analyze these samples. And you can see them laid out there in summary as to what we get on and do. In terms of microscopy, sometimes you can see things down the microscope just looking without staining first. Um, So-called wet prep can be informative. If you look at a urine that may be infected, you might be able to tell a lot just by looking down the microscope. With the organism that causes syphilis, Treponema pallidum, if you shine a light from the side, um, so the, but beneath the preparation you're looking at is dark, but the light's coming from the side, it then gets scattered, and you can actually see these very thin organisms. They're very thin and, and helical, and they, they dart around very quickly. So this picture here is actually catching them statically, but when you actually see them down the microscope, they're all over the place. So that can be very useful for making a very quick diagnosis of syphilis from a, a syphilitic, syphilitic lesion. There are a number of different ways in which we can stain preparations, and I'm not going to dwell on these. The gram stain and acid fast staining are the two most important ones that you will come across. I gather you've already been told about the gram stain, so I won't rehearse every step of the gram stain here. But you have basically the idea is you try and stain bacteria, you then try and destain them, and then you counter stain them. And some bacteria will retain the stain, um, even under decolorization with acetone. These we call gram positive. Those that don't retain the stain take up the counter stain, and those we call gram negative. And gram positives appear pink, and gram negatives appear uh, gram positives appear purple, gram negatives appear pink. What the gram stain allows us to do is, in effect, divide up the microbiological world or bacteriological world into four quadrants, depending on the shape of the cells and what kind of gram stain uh, morphology they have, what kind of uh, whether they're positive or negative. And you can see them laying out here. The gram stain actually can be used in two different settings. So we can, if we have a colony on a plate, we can gram stain it, and we can say, oh, that's a gram positive coccus or a gram negative rod or whatever. But there are occasions when we can actually gram stain clinical material directly. So in the top there, you can see a smear of pus that's come from someone's urethra who has gonorrhea. <coughs> and within that pus, you can see Lots and lots of neutrophils, pus cells, and in some of them you can see that stippling which re represents those gram-negative ne intracellular diplococci. Beneath it there's a pure culture of E. coli which is showing you what it looks like. Now the gram stain doesn't work all the time, it's not always valuable for every bacterium. Mycobacteria will use this acid fast staining. Spirochetes like Treponema pallidum I mentioned earlier which causes syphilis it doesn't stain up very well with the gram stain, and that's why we use these alternative approaches. And there are some intracellular bacteria which we really can't visualize also with the gram stain. So that's microscopy. Culture. When we're trying to plate these, when we're trying to grow these things, we have a choice. We can either grow them on solid media or we can grow them on liquid media. Solid media we can divide into plates, agar plates. So they're made out of this stuff, a bit like jelly that sets agar, and you can put various things into the medium uh, to help with growth, to help with uh, creating indicators, and so forth. So we can use agar plates for identification. We can also use them for enumeration, so we can count the number of colonies and get an idea of how much there was in the starting material. Slopes, the, the main uh, use that we, you'll come across of slopes in the, in the lab is for TB. <coughs> And that's because this organism takes so long to grow that if we put them on plates, they, the plates would just dry out and they become a bit like kind of uh, prawn crackers that you get with your Chinese takeaway. That's what happens to agar plates if they're left for weeks and weeks on end. 
The other alternative approach is to use liquid medium, liquid medium such as a broth. And the advantage this has is that it actually has uh, maximum sensitivity. So a single bacterial cell inoculated into a broth culture, incubated overnight, will result in a cloudy, turbid culture the next day, and you'll be able to um, determine what it is. So there you see these so-called uh, blood culture bottles, um, which uh, is uh, probably the, the commonest uh, use of broth culture in microbiology. So when we take blood for culture, we put it directly into those bottles, and then only later on does that get plated out when something has grown. Now, most bacteria will grow overnight, or within a couple of days at least. Um, there are some fussy bacteria, we call them fastidious bacteria. There are some anaerobes that require there to be no oxygen around. These may take a bit longer. There are some bacteria which are real, a real nuisance that grow really very slowly. TB is one of them. That will take weeks to grow, sometimes even months. Mycobacterium leprae can't be grown at all in the laboratory. Uh, can only be grown in animals. So you can grow it in, in mice, in, in their foot pads, and you can grow it in armadillos. It's one of those strange kind of pub quiz factoids that the only other animal that will sustain the growth of Mycobacterium leprae apart from us is the nine-banded armadillo. But that's not really practical for diagnostic purposes. Treponema pallidum also can't be grown in the lab. You can grow that in rabbit testes and so forth, but again, we don't even try that. And there are some bacteria which can only be grown in cell cultures, these ones that are intracellular, like chlamydia and rickettsia. So when we're dealing with these kind of organisms, we often rely on uh, non-culture-based approaches, uh, either molecular methods like PCR, polymerase chain reaction to detect DNA or RNA, or we rely on serodiagnostic approaches like antibody detection. Now, to return to solid media, what are the advantages of using a solid medium, solid growth medium? Well, there are basically three. One is that when we inoculate onto this medium and we leave it overnight, we get what we call colonies. And each of those colonies represents the growth from one starting cell. So it's what we call a clonal population. Um, and we can look at those colonies and they'll have particular shapes, particular size, particular consistencies, some might be dry, some might appear wet and so forth. And we can, from the, on the basis of that, we can make uh, a tentative identification of what kind of organism it is. The other important point, though, is that when we've got one of those colonies, that we, sub, we can subculture it, we can take part of that colony and put it onto a new plate, then we obtain the organism in pure culture. And that is a requirement for definitive identification. We basically like to propagate things in pure culture and then we can test them further. The third reason for doing this, which is sometimes used, is that you can also count the number of colonies uh, obtained on a plate. So if each of those colonies is, is, is uh, coming from a single cell, we sometimes use the term colony forming units for these single cells that are in the original inoculum, you can do a bit of arithmetic to work out how many colonies you've got on your agar plate and how much of the original inoculum, inoculum went in and how much it was diluted, let's say, to work out whether there were 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 bacteria in the original starting uh, inoculum. Now, when we try and identify bacteria, we can look at the morphology down the microscope and see whether they're gram-positive, gram-negative, whether they come in pairs or in chains or in clumps and so forth. We can also look at their morphology on the plate, which you mentioned, the, the, the colonial morphology. We can also look at their growth re requirements. So on these plates here, you can see the use of agar that's got something added to it. So at the top there, that's blood agar. And we've got three different kinds of streptococci growing on that blood agar. One of those kinds of streptococci is completely <laughs> degrading the blood, all the blood cells, and making it completely clear. The other one there is breaking down some of the red cells, but not degrading them completely and making them go a bit greenish. And the other one's not doing anything at all. So this we call beta hemolysis. This we call alpha hemolysis. And that one up there is not hemolytic at all. And that can be a useful thing that you can see on the plate straight away and will help us classify and identify a bacterium. Similarly, 
Here we have a different kind of medium called McConkie's agar. This has got lactose in it and an indicator. And when the lactose is fermented, you see a colour change. So when it's lactose positive, it goes this really dark pink colour here. When it's lactose negative, it stays this kind of rather dull kind of orangish colour. And this will help us, say, separate salmonella from E. coli. E. coli is lactose positive, lactose fermenter. Salmonella is a non-lactose fermenter. So we can continue doing these kind of things. We can also look at biochemistry, look at enzymes, antigens. This here is what's known as an API strip. And what you do here is you make a, a suspension of your bacterium in pure culture, once, once you've picked a colony. And then you apply that to each of these cupules. And you leave it for a certain time, whether it's overnight or four hours. And then you come back and you just read the colour changes. So it's really very straightforward. And most of these colour changes will be because the bacterium has been able to ferment a particular sugar. And you can get a profile of the organism from its sugar fermentation reactions and other biochemical reactions. And that will then allow you to identify it. So that's microscopy and culture. Sensitivity. Well, this is referring to antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Uh, uh, one of the most widely used methods for doing this is the so-called disk diffusion test. And what you do here is you make a suspension of the bacterium and you apply it to the plate and it, when the plate's incubated overnight, that will grow as a lawn across the whole of the plate, kind of uniform thickness and consistency. Uh, but before you incubate, you apply these little discs, and the discs contain antibiotics. Each one will contain a different antibiotic, may contain different amounts of antibiotic. And if the bacterium is sensitive to that antibiotic, you'll get a zone of clearing around the disc the following day. So because the antibiotic will diffuse out into the agar and inhibit the growth of that bacterium around it. Um, and so in this way, we can actually very quickly work out whether a bacterium is sensitive or resistant to a particular agent, and we can get a, actually some kind of semi-quantitative measure of how sensitive or how resistant it is by looking at the size of those inhibition zones. <clears throat> a more um, definitive method for actually working out whether a bacterium is sensitive to a particular antibiotic, this is a lot more cumbersome. We'd only do this in certain circumstances, uh, say endocarditis, a very serious infection where we really want to know how sensitive the organism is. We do this test, the MIC test, or the Minimum Inhibitory Concentration Procedure. And what you do here is you dilute the antibiotic in doubling dilutions. So you might start off with 8 uh, milligrams per litre, and then you 4, 2, 1, and so forth. Um, and then you also apply the bacterium and some broth to that. So the, well, the antibiotic is diluted in broth, and then you apply some of the, some of the bacterium you leave it overnight, and some of these tubes will, will go cloudy. Some of them will stay clear. The ones where it's cloudy, the bacterium has grown, even in the presence of the antibiotic. The ones where it's clear, the antibiotic has inhibited the growth. Um, and so what we call the minimum inhibitory concentration is the lowest concentration of antibiotic that will stop the bacteria from growing. So it's the, the, the tube which will stay clear uh, at the lowest concentration. So here it's two, because that's, that tube has stayed clear, uh, and the next one down is not. Now, just as we move on to the rest of the talk, one quick slide on viral infection. Virus is quite different from bacteria. We have to use a whole range of other things to do, which I'm not going to read out all of them. We can't grow viruses on agar plates. We have to do all these other things in instead. And in fact, with viruses, because they're a bit harder to uh, identify and isolate and so on, we rely much more heavily on molecular methods such as polymerase chain reaction. Okay, now um, it's a bit of a, a ragbag of, of, of things in this talk. We're going to move on to epidemiology very quickly and just, just give you some basic sprinkling of terms and terminology. So we talk about the different patterns of infection. We talk about sporadic infections, which are rare infections, to occur every now and then, but without any particular pattern. They're kind of like acts of God, if you like. 
So, you know, in a large hospital like this one, every few years you might come across a case of gas gangrene in someone who has got a bad leg wound or something like that. Um, but there wouldn't be any particular pattern to it, it's just chance. And it wouldn't be very common. Epidemic is where we see a sudden unexpected rise uh, in a particular infection. And this can be, you can have an, in one sense, you can have a, an epidemic if there's only two people, although when it's small, we call them outbreaks. Um, and it can then range to the whole of the country. So you could have a, a flu epidemic that sweeps through the whole country. In fact, pandemics uh, are the same thing writ larger across the whole world. There we can talk about the HIV pandemic, the, the relentless spread of HIV over the last 30 years across the globe. We can talk about the same with influenza, that various strains of influenza will sweep across the whole planet. And then endemic implies a constant significant number of infections, a drip, drip, drip of infections, if you like, just going on into the future indefinitely, a kind of nuisance that never quite goes away. So MRSA, which we've heard of, is actually sadly endemic to many hospitals in this country. You go to a hospital and you'll say, when did you last have an MRSA? They'll say, well, yesterday or the day before. Um, they won't have long periods where they don't get any. So putting that in um, graphical terms, if we look at a, an epidemic infection or an outbreak, what we'll see here is a sudden start. You might get one day where it's just a couple, but then suddenly it all takes off. It's kind of front-loaded, most of the actions at the beginning of the, of the outbreak. Typically, when you see that kind of pattern, it's because there's what known as a, what's known as a point source for the outbreak. So there's one thing that's actually produced that outbreak and kick-started it. So if you went into the hospital nearby on this campus, and one day everyone started uh, being sick with diarrhea and vomiting, you might suspect that it was something they'd eaten. Um, and with, this is what we would see with a, say, a salmonella outbreak in a hospital. We'd see on Monday you might get two cases of salmonella, gastroenteritis. Tuesday you get 20. Wednesday you get 30. Uh, and then it starts to tail off again. Sometimes with those kind of outbreaks, particularly say with salmonella, it might just sputter on a little bit because although it's not very efficient, there is sometimes human-to-human -human spread. So although most of the patients get the salmonella from that chicken that they ate that wasn't cooked properly, there may be one or two patients who actually get infected by the patient in the adjacent bed who's been incontinent all over the place. And I don't want to put too many graphical pictures in your mind, but you get the idea. Endemic infection, this is what you'd see with, say, Staph aureus wound infections <coughs> or even MRSA infections in a hospital. It's kind of grumbling along, spreading from person to person, there may be carriers out there that don't get symptomatic, you don't see them, but then it pops up in a clinical setting somehow. Okay, well, so let's now just pause the thought and say, well, where do patients actually get infected from? What are the sources of infections? So we can basically divide it into three big categories. This is out there in the community, not in hospitals. So human, you can get it from your infection from another human. You can get it from animals, or you can get it from the inanimate environment. So among humans, obviously, if it's a clinical case, it's fairly straightforward. That person's got measles, I caught it from them. They've got chicken pox, I caught it from them, and so on. Sometimes people have prolonged periods of convalescence, though, where they're carrying the uh, organism after they've stopped being ill, and they're still shedding it. Sometimes people don't even get ill. They just get colonised in the organism and keep shedding it. And we see these kind of patterns there. Another option is a so-called auto-infection. So we mentioned in an earlier lecture that UTI is usually caused by E. coli. The E. coli that a young woman presents to the GP with in her bladder has actually come usually from her own um, uh, uh, fecal microbiota. And, and she's been carrying that for some time. So she's got infected with her own strain. Similarly, when you get candida, you get thrush. That candida is probably in your bowel to start with in very small amounts, and then you get infected with something you've been carrying along all the time. 
Infections from animals, we call these zoonoses, it's a special term for infections of humans that are caught from animals. And again, we've got clinical cases or carriers. There's an added complication we sometimes, in, not so much in this country, but in other parts of the world, you see vector-borne infections like malaria, where a mosquito will actually bite you and carry the, the infection from one person to another. In the environment, well, all sorts of things there, soil, water, food, um, even the air. So we mentioned Legionnaire's disease travels on the air, particularly in hospital environments, in, in where there's air conditioning, in hotels, that sort of stuff. In hospitals, fairly similar. We tend not to have many animals in hospitals, so they're not quite so much in the picture, although there are case reports of people catching MRSA from the hospital cat um, and such like. But we have cross-infection, symptomless carriers, MRSA, gentamicin resistant organisms, E. coli and so on. You get clinical cases where they've got obvious infection and then auto-infection. And here, probably the commonest cause of auto-infection is where people get infected from a staph aureus that they're carrying themselves. It gets into their, they pick their nose, they pick their wound, they inoculate their own staph aureus into their own wound and they get infection. I'm being a bit... I mean, I'm simplifying things, but basically, if you sample their nose when they come in, they'll have a staph aureus in there. <coughs> they get a, a wound infection a couple of weeks later. It will be the same strain. Sadly, even in the, in the hospital, which we kind of think of as a place of sanctuary and healing, the environment is not safe. And there are plenty of examples of uh, hospital foodborne uh, outbreaks food poisoning, salmonella is very common in hospitals, in the past anyway. Um, ventilators, disinfectants, uh, these can all be uh, carrying infection, endoscopes, all of these things. And you may notice if you go into a hospital, you'll see that there are certain features of the hospital design that prevent, say, dust accumulating. So you'll see that if you look at the, 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 where the wall meets the floor, there's always a beveled edge there, a curve. So there's no place, no corners for dust to settle and, uh, and, and survive. And that's so that staph aureus cannot uh, uh, survive in the environment so quite so easily. So if we want to, in, to in control infection, what do we do? We've got basically three options. We can remove the reservoir or source of infection. We can interrupt transmission or we can increase host resistance to infection. So if we're talking about the community, we can go out and remove sources. So if it's human-to-human -human transmission is the concern, we can go out and find the active cases of disease and treat them. So for tuberculosis, that will be a good way of preventing transmission of tuberculosis, is to go out and get all the people you can who have TB and treat them, stop them being infectious. This is, um, well, we also, another option we have is that we can, we can uh, trace contacts and we can treat individual cases and then trace their contacts and treat the contacts as well and diagnose the contacts. This is very common with sexually transmitted diseases. So if someone's got gonorrhea, they will ask about the contacts of that person. They'll contact those people. They'll give all of them uh, treatment uh, to prevent the infection. Animals, there's a lot of controversy in the, in the news at the moment about badger culling and so forth and the, the effect of bovine tuberculosis on the dairy produce, uh, dairy, dairy farming and so forth. But it, these, to some degree these kind of approaches do work. Uh, obviously keep controlling the environment, making sure we drink clean water, that's also very important. To stop transmission out there in the community we have to avoid overcrowding. Uh, and for some of these uh, infections, you know, what they call social distancing, making people stay at home, not go to school, those kind of things are effective ways of interacting transmission. Changing people's behaviours, trying to, say, to, to prevent STDs, you can get people to engage in safe sex. You may isolate the infectious cases. Um, it's an interesting uh, question as to how ethical it is to actually force someone into isolation against their will. I think there are still on the statute books they have the right to in incarcerate people if they present a serious risk to others. And then um, 
interrupting transmission from animals and the environment, well, food hygiene, so not mixing raw and cooked food in your kitchen, making sure that food is cooked properly, controlling vectors, vaccinating animals, poop scooping, all those kind of things. And then, of course, we one of the reasons that we don't get as sick as our ancestors is that we have now much improved diets, we get immunized, and a very particular uh, intervention is the so-called chemoprophylaxis, where we give uh, antibiotic treatment, not because someone's sick, but to prevent them from getting sick. So that if someone gets meningitis, we may give their brother and their sister treatment to prevent the brother and sister from getting meningitis, um, as, as what we call chemoprophylaxis. Now that's a cue for me to say a few words about immunization. Um, just what is this? Well, it's the use of vaccines or antibodies to prevent, uh, to, pro to provide immune protection against infectious diseases. And there are two main kinds of vaccination. There's so-called passive, so passive immunization and active immunization. So passive immunization, you actually take preformed antibodies from another host and you give them to an individual. Now, the advantage of that is that it brings instantaneous protection. So let's say you're a leukemia patient, and I've walked onto your ward, and I am floridly incubating chickenpox just in the prodrome, and I may have infected you with chickenpox virus. If you get given antibodies straight away, you are immediately protected. You don't have to wait any time at all. Problem is that the antibodies get washed out of your system after, I don't know, about six weeks or so you're no longer protected. Active uh, immunization with vaccines, here we use modified or purified pathogen product, products, and there you're having to stimulate the immune response in that individual host in front of you. And that may take a few weeks, a couple of weeks to happen. To happen. So um, if you need immediate protection, then this is not quite so good. But the great thing is that this gives you long-lasting protection that may last for years after the, the vaccination, or maybe even decades. When we do active immunization, we have a variety of approaches we can use, depending on the kind of vaccine we, we, we're using. So one approach is to take what we call live attenuated uh, organisms. So these are bacteria or viruses which are still able to replicate in body tissues, but they're not able to cause the full-blown disease. They have very limited replication in the tissues. But they're antigenically so similar to the, the real pathogen that they will provide cross-protection. So there are some, some of them listed there. The BCG, for example, is very closely related to tuberculosis, but it... And it does actually, if it gets stuck in your arm, it does cause a limited infection. It gets a bit gooey with a bit of a purulent response there and so forth. But it doesn't spread throughout the body and cause full-blown disease. You can use killed microorganisms um, where you actually take a, an extract of the organism and inactivate it. And there's some listed there. You can take extracts from the organism. So you kill it and then you extract out a particular part of that culture. You can even be more exquisite and just take one particular chemical from the organism. So for the meningococcus, for meningococcal vaccines against men C, for example, we take the capsule and purify that alone. And then finally, there's one other option which is highly successful in many different settings, and that is to purify out toxins, or protein toxins from the organism, and inactivate them as toxins but allow them to retain their immunological characteristics. And uh, we do this, say, with diphtheria or tetanus, where we take diphtheria toxin and we treat it with formalin, which stops it being a toxin anymore, but still preserves its antigenic profile. And this can give protection against a, a number of different infections. What, what's the advantage of live attenuated versus killed? So live attenuated vaccines have many advantages in that they multiply inside the human host. They provide much stronger immune uh, stimulation, which means that they produce much longer uh, immunity. Problem is that they, if they're given to an immunocompromised host, they may actually start replicating that host more than you want and actually cause disease in that host. 
And there is also a risk that they may revert to a virulent form, although m m most of the vaccines we use now, they've been tested for so long that that's not likely to happen. Perhaps one counterexample there is polio, where we now recognise that the biggest risk from polio in many populations is not from wild-type polio, but from vaccine strains that are circulating in the community that can still cause polio myelitis. Kill vaccines have many advantages in it. Those advantages that they, they're not going to cause an infection. There's no possibility of that. But unfortunately, they're not quite as uh, strong in terms of their stimulation of the immune so response. So you have to give them multiple times. You have to ha often have to give them uh, with some kind of what we call an adjuvant, which uh, boosts up their ability to, to uh, affect immunity. Right, the last uh, few slides now. We're nearly, nearly finished. I just need to say a few words about healthcare-associated infections. So you might argue it's a, it, it's, it's a paradox, it's a tragedy, it's something that shouldn't happen. But sadly, when people go into hospital, they often do get infected with organisms which they wouldn't have got infected with if they were outside in the community. We sometimes use the term nosocomial infections also for, for these kind of infections. And you can see there in that uh, pie chart, there's a range of different kinds of infection uh, that happen to patients in hospital. Why should we worry about this? Well, it's argued that about 10 to 15 percent of patients, when they go into hospital, will get some kind of infection. It costs our economy billions of pounds per year dealing with this. And if we have one large outbreak um, in a hospital, then that can cost us thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of pounds trying to deal with that outbreak. And, and it has a miserable effect on, on people. They get sicker for longer, they're stuck in hospital, they can't get discharged, they have to have toxic drugs, uh, they may be isolated from other patients, it's very demoralising. And in the end, people will actually start losing confidence in, in the hospitals and in healthcare. There was a colleague of mine whose wife was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer and she was going to go into hospital and have an operation. And he was more worried about her catching MRSA than he was about the fact that she had breast cancer. Uh, struck me as, as just a sign of how demoralising these things can be. So why do the patients in healthcare... Uh, premises get infections and why is it different from what you see out there in the in the community well many of the patients have got impaired immunity in, in, in the sense of their immune systems not working as well as they should because they've had therapy for cancer a transplant say if someone has a, a kidney transplant they get immunosuppression at the extremes of age very very premature babies will not have a fully formed immune system uh, and similarly, someone who's very, very old won't be as robust in their immune responses as, as a, a younger person. I mentioned earlier about the importance of the integrity of physiology and anatomy in protecting you against infection, and that's those things are breached in hospitals. A patient lying flat on their back in the intensive care unit after an operation, they will have a surgical wound, they will have... Uh, cannulas going into their bloodstream, they'll have a catheter going into their bladder, all of these providing roots into the body which normally would not be there. And they would also have impaired physiology. So many patients in an intensive care unit will have what we call a paralytic ileus. Their bowels will stop working, the normal peristalsis will have stopped and it's all just sitting there. Similarly, uh, they'll be flat on their back, they won't be able to cough as normal, They'll be accumulating secretions in their lungs, uh, and that won't be work. Uh, th that won't get cleared away either. The other problem is that hospitals, by na very nature, you're cramming together vulnerable people, um, and uh, you know, in a sense, these are these, many, many of these patients would have died a generation ago, but we're now keeping them hanging on to life for long periods of time, but close to each other, and the healthcare personnel move from one patient to another; they can transmit infection. It's not all bad news. I mean, if we look at what's happened on this campus in the last year or so, we've now moved all these patients into a purpose-built new hospital, and 40% of them now have single rooms, which is a great improvement 
over what we used to have, where we used to have these long, what they were called nightingale wards, where you'd have uh, maybe 20 patients in a ward and a nurse is stationed in the middle and a sink at either end. This was obviously uh, a place in which bacteria could spread and viruses could spread very effectively. So things are moving forward in that regard. The other problem with healthcare associated infection is that there is this distinctive hospital microbiota. So if you're in hospital, you can get a normal infection just like anyone else, but you also can get infected with these so-called opportunist pathogens that only come in when you've got impaired immunity. And a big problem is that many of the bacteria that are in the hospital are multi-drug resistant because antibiotics are used so widely in hospitals that they're just selecting in a Darwinian way for this multi-drug resistance. Um, you know, it's been said that you can actually go into hospital dust and find measurable amounts of antibiotic just in the dust. The environment is so heavily contaminated with them. So how do we control infection in the hospital? Well, we can remove the sources, discharge patients when they're infectious, treat and decontaminate them. It's easier said than done sometimes. We can control the environment. Every hospital has a folder this big explaining how to prevent Legionnaire's disease from occurring in those healthcare premises. Uh, you may see, you go in hospital, they keep the temperature of the hot tap a bit hotter than you would have it at home to prevent Legionella from replicating. We can interrupt transmission. Hand washing is very important there. Aseptic techniques, sterilization, disinfection. We can look after the hospital environment as well. So if we want to increase host resistance, that we, can, we can do that by giving good nutri nutrition. So someone who's in an intensive care unit, being run over by a bus, they get scooped up, put in the intensive care unit, and then let's say they're unconscious, flat on their back for days afterwards. They're not going to be able to eat food, so we have to actually give them feeding uh, to actually maintain their nutrition. Restore normal physiology very quickly, vaccinate, stimulate immunities. Anyway, let's move on quickly. We can also isolate infectious patients, put them in a side room, and we can give prophylaxis, as we mentioned before. <coughs> Hand hygiene is important. Uh, actually, people in the hospital are taught how to wash their hands with this seven-point hand-washing approach to actually prevent cross-infection. Last, last two slides now. Just have to mention disinfection and sterilization. These are very boring subjects and nobody likes to lecture on them, nobody likes to be lectured on them. So we cut it down to two slides from about six last year. Disinfection is where we destroy microbes, um, killing all the vegetative forms, the, th the things that are growing, but we don't kill the spores. Antisepsis is where we're trying to do something similar but doing it on living tissue. And sterilization is where we actually kill everything. All the spores, even the most resistant forms of the organisms. And just one thing I'd like to bring to your attention, the, the use of the autoclave, autoclaving. You'll see this actually in laboratories, uh, research labs as well. What we do here, it's like a, effectively like a, a massive great pressure cooker, uh, which relies on steam penetration and temperature. That's me finished. So we're taking you through how we diagnose infection, epidemiology, basic terms, control of infection, vaccination, and health.